My name is Mathieu Grosjean. I work on uh, smart city projects for the German organization called Steinbeis Europa Centrum, which is responsible for exploitation in the project Removen. And I will moderate this webinar. Are you interested in the project and our smart city solutions being tested in different European cities and their opportunities for you and your organization? Please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. We will be glad to give you advice on how to proceed. During today's session, Three experts involved in the project Remoban will discuss the ways to tackle fuel poverty. In the UK, this issue concerns around 11% of households and can be answered by innovative solutions elaborated with their residents. Nottingham became the first city in the, in the UK to adopt a groundbreaking approach to retrofitting housing solutions known as Energy Sprung, which is an approach pioneered in the Netherlands and focusing on the performance of the property. This pilot project has radically improved how to heat homes in Nottingham, bringing them up to 2050 standards and enabling the residents of these homes to become ultra-low energy consumers. They will benefit from a much warmer and healthier home and lower energy bills, thus answering food poverty issue. The project has been supported and part financed by the Smart City Horizon 2020 project, Remoban, which is developing a groundbreaking model to show how sustainability can be integrated into the regeneration of our towns and cities. Nottingham is one of three demonstrator cities and two follower cities presented on this slide. As you might notice, your microphones have been muted. This is to prevent any interruptions while the speakers carry out their presentations. As the topic of today's agenda are presented, you may have comments or questions for our speakers. If that is your case, please don't hesitate to write them down in the everyone's chat box. I will collect them during the course of the presentations and ask them aloud to our speakers in the dedicated questions and answers session at the end of this webinar. Now, let me introduce the three speakers of our webinar. First, the problem of fuel poverty in the, in the UK and what has been done and what is planned to tackle it will be presented by Matt Copeland, who is policy manager at the National Energy Action. Then, Josh Sawyer, who is project development coordinator at the Na National Energy Action will share insights and lessons learned related to the possibility for innovation to benefit vulnerable consumers and solutions gathered through the National Energy Action's Technical Innovation Fund. Afterwards, we will focus on remote and funded communal heating projects in Nottingham, thanks to the presentation of Harnut Andrews, project manager for Nottingham City Homes. At last, we will answer your question and welcome your comments. OK, then let us understand better the problem of fuel poverty in the United Kingdom. Thanks, Matt. Matt the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Great. OK, so I've just got a few slides um, to give you some background on fuel poverty in the UK. Um, so fuel poverty in the UK is a problem that's recognized by all major political parties 
and because of this there has been lots of legislation put through government to, uh, to try and counteract it. Um, part of that is to give it a definition um, and I've got the definition on screen now and that is that a household can be considered fuel poor if it has both above average required energy costs and low income. So low income in, in this case is defined as below the poverty line which is um, less than 60% of the median income. So it's really a, a high cost, low income uh, definition. So if you have high energy costs and don't earn much money. Um, with that definition, uh, we can calculate that there's approximately two and a half million households um, living in fuel poverty in England. And that accounts for 11% of all households in England which hopefully gives you a scale, the scale of the problem which is rel relatively large and something that we really need to act against. So I said that it's uh, a problem that is, that is known and um, understood by, by, the, by the major political parties and because of that we have a fuel poverty strategy. This is a government strategy um, that looks to eradicate fuel poverty. And it does this by setting out that um, that the way to do that is to improve the energy efficiency of homes. So to reduce the energy costs of homes rather than uh, increase the income out of the definition. Um, and to, uh, in, in order to do this, they've set um, a number of milestones and targets. Um, and these milestones are to get all fuel poor homes to EPC uh, C by 2030 uh, with two milestones which is E by 2020 and D by 2025. So it's a stage, of, stage effect to get there. In England, um, we've dealt with this through uh, a policy called the Energy Companies Obligation. Uh, this is our only current policy for delivering energy efficiency to fuel poor households in, uh, in England. Um, and essentially is uh, an extra charge that is put on everyone's bill um, which goes into a pot for energy suppliers to spend on energy efficiency improvements in fuel poor households. There's previously been other schemes, but this is the only one that remains. Uh, there is a, a second scheme that is not to do with energy efficiency, but is also aimed at fuel poor households called the warm home discount. The warm home discount um, gives approximately £140 discount to um, households who receive benefits. <coughs> Sorry. This, um, this £140 obviously helps with the uh, low income side of the calculation to, to determine whether someone's fuel poor. But it's an annual payment and um, therefore is is not an, an ongoing effect like energy efficiency is uh, with energy bills. Therefore, it's not a lasting solution. And unfortunately, funding for energy efficiency through ECO isn't enough um, to cover all fuel poor households and meet our fuel poverty targets. The Committee on Fuel Poverty in the UK has, um, has recommended a £1 billion fund to help upgrade uh, inefficient housing of fuel poor households to top up ECO in order to meet our 2020 milestone. NEA believes that this is the key policy required in the short term and we will fight um, and lobby to ensure that, that this money is, is found in government to spend for this cause. Um, okay, now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Josh who is going to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the technical work that we do in NEA. Josh? Thank you, Matt. Uh, yeah, as Matt says, I also work for NEA. Uh, I work on the technical team primarily. And as part of the technical team, we look to test innovative energy systems, technologies, and services. Um, and so I'll run you through um, what National Energy Action have been doing with uh, regard to our technical innovation fund and also uh, some of the, the key lessons that we've learned from. Uh, installing innovative systems and technologies in fuel poor homes. Uh, so I'll first offer some uh, background facts to the current and future demographic landscape of vulnerability in the UK. 
So at the moment, there's nearly 6 million electricity consumers and 4.8 million gas consumers on the priority services register. Around 5 million adults in the UK have never used the internet. And between 2012 and 2032, the fastest growing age range will be the over 75s. Now, those facts set the scene for some of the issues and concerns centered around innovation in the energy sector. Uh, whilst these changes are taking place, there is also the uh, great potential for energy consumers to benefit as the energy system becomes more decarbonized, decentralized, and digitalized. So uh, there's going to be benefits from electric vehicles, battery storage, smart time of use tariffs, and low carbon heating networks. These will all change uh, the structure of UK energy supply and demand. And the question is, will this transition entrench uh, the disadvantage uh, in the UK energy system, or will new solutions be developed to eliminate fuel poverty? Uh, vulnerable consumers are going to share in the risks and the costs of this transition, so they should also benefit from uh, the positives that are likely to come about. So I'll tell you a little bit about the Technical Innovation Fund, which was set up to determine how innovative measures and systems could assist those in fuel poverty. So it was a fund um, where projects could bid in for funding. Um, some of the projects that were funded include installing gas and air source heat pump hybrid systems in off-gas homes relying on oil or electricity, installing smart thermostats in social housing, and installing battery storage to increase the use of on-site generation. And we'll go into some of the lessons uh, and learnings shortly, but it's been recognized the importance of innovation uh, in ECO3, so the latest iteration of ECO that Mark was talking about earlier. Up to a cap of 10% of a supplier's obligation can be met through innovative measures now. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, it's important to understand what works and what doesn't, um, not just for those um, who are able to pay and will benefit, but all of those energy consumers who are within the system. So I think this sets out sort of the key um, key understandings of how best to approach um, this transition. So through the Technical Innovation Fund, we were able to understand the impact innovation had on energy costs, thermal comfort, and levels of household engagement with the services provided. Uh, but also, we were able to learn what worked well, what didn't work, how to approach it, and what we would do differently. So the, the first aspect of that would be the en engaging. So are we reaching the right people? Uh, have other factors been considered, other vulnerabilities? Uh, you know, are there debt issues? Is income maximization required? But also matching resources to those who need it. So making sure the, the time and resources available to offer full support throughout the project uh, and understand those needs. Second is assist. So don't fit and forget. Uh, ensure that users are supported from initial engagement uh, through development and then post install too. Uh, the third, simplify. So this refers to information and instructions. Um, there's been plenty of unwieldy instruction booklets and complicated controls on these projects. Uh, so a new shiny piece of equipment is useless if a resident doesn't know how to engage with it or doesn't understand what benefit that brings. And then finally, evaluating. So what worked and what can be improved? And this could relate to the technology itself or the processes behind it. So identifying those in fuel poverty uh, supporting those processes to offer support. Um, so, yeah, that's everything from me. So, I'll pass you on to Arno now. We will give you a run through distributed energy. Thanks, Josh. Uh, approaching the end of this webinar, let me remind you to write down the questions that you might have in the everyone's chat box. So, now it's Arna time to present us Remoban funded communal heating project in Nottingham. Arna, out, please. Thank you. Okay, afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Arnold Andrews. I have many jobs. I'm primarily here today to talk uh, about the projects we've done in Nottingham because one of those jobs is working for Nottingham City Homes. Nottingham City Homes is a social housing provider here in Nottingham. What I'll do is I'll give you a high level overview of uh, a couple of our urban projects which include communal heating or distributed energy. Um, as my slide suggests, I love distributed energy. I'm a massive fan. Um, but like any relationship, uh, communal energy can be difficult. It is possible to get it wrong. It's not always easy. So let's just think about some of those issues and pitfalls that you can fall into. If you get distributed energy wrong enough, you can negate all of the benefits that are there to be gained from communal heating. There are three key areas to make sure you get right. The first one is design. A regular failing is over design of systems. My top picture, if you look carefully, that's actually a massive radiator. Normally over design in new build systems is far more subtle than that. Um, but over design builds in inefficiency. The second key area is around build quality and commissioning. And you can see in my other picture, this was something a builder tried to hand over to us in Nottingham, where they'd effectively just shown the pipe to the insulation. It certainly wasn't installed to the current British standards. And they looked at us in shock when we refused to accept it until they went away and did a better job of it. The third area is operation and integration. We often call this plant room to boardroom. It's about the way that you actually live with communal heating, what it means in terms of tenants, um, systems, metering and billing. All those things are important in terms of having a system that works for everybody. I've included a little web reference in there for Chirpy. Uh, Chirpy came from communal heating in registered providers. It was sort of a self-help group for social housing providers in the UK who had uh, communal heating issues. So you can go along and visit that website uh, look at their resources or or cry for help. Okay, so that's kind of the um, way to get it wrong. This is hopefully the ways to get it right. Um, <coughs> we'll focus on our two Remorban projects here. So our first Remorban communal heating project is the courts. Uh, there are 94 homes in four blocks in this project. Uh, they've had energy efficiency measures. They the scaffolding is still up around the block while we complete the external wall insulation, um, deliver those energy efficiency measures. The system has PV, which you can just make out in the photo. We've in also installed a private wire system and a battery. Uh, we'll talk slightly more about that when we come on to the 2050s. So what is interesting about this in district heating terms are two or three things. The first one is that we made sure that our designer and our installer for our communal energy was the same organization. And we've contracted them to deliver us a system with 80% efficiency. If the system isn't 80% efficiency, that means that the, uh, the installer can't blame the designer, while the designer blames the installer because they're one and the same. That organization are responsible for delivering that efficiency. And we have the monitoring kit so we can test it and make sure it actually works the way it's supposed to. The second interesting thing here is that we're actually using the returns, the outputs from one district heated scheme to feed another. So Nottingham has a sort of uh, partly city-wide district heating scheme, which is fed from the energy from waste plant. That runs at a relatively high temperature. So there are some tower blocks across the road from these uh, low-rise flats. And their output temperature is in the order of 70 degrees. So we're going to take that output and use it as the input for these flats. We can do that uh, primarily because the insulation work, uh, measures that we're putting in here mean we can run a lower temperature district heating system. Um, so what's this doing for us? We have modeled our tenants' energy bills in these blocks. And we anticipate that their energy bills will be in the order of £628 a year for all energy. Average UK energy bills are about £1,400, so that's significantly less than half of the average UK bill. Uh, so this project would be really exciting 
unfortunately for it, it's been completely outdone by the next one, our 2050 Energy Sprong homes. Uh, in the original Remorban project, there were 10 homes which were improved. You can see the before and the after picture. They have a deep retrofit, so they, that's a complete um, insulation. Effectively, we've kind of built an insulated house around the existing house. So they, we drive down the um, heating demand to very low levels. Um, we have low temperature district heating. That's fed from a communal ground source heat pump system in this case. We've got PV on both sides of the roof, another private wire system. We have battery storage and thermal storage. Um, so what this gives us is a next level mini grid where everything is fully integrated. Having a communal heating system allows us to get the benefits of diversity, i.e. if somebody's out and not using any power, the PV on their roof is still useful to the house next door because they're all interconnected. What we can, the, the other benefit here is in terms of what it costs to invest in things in the first place. If we had a battery in every single house individually, that would put up the cost of the batteries significantly. And again, we'd have a lot of stranded assets or places where things aren't being used. By having everything on a mini grid, we can afford uh, a, a more cost effective battery and that optimizes the way that we can use this. So that storage, we've got something like 4,000 litres of storage in our energy centre for these homes, and then we've got another 300 litres inside each home in addition to our battery. That storage allows us to optimise how we use heat and when we use heat. It means that we can completely or largely decouple the time when we have a demand for energy and the time when we actually take it from the grid. In the UK, the grid system is stressed by peak loading. Everybody wants power at the same time, and that's a problem for the whole electricity supply industry. Well, because of our storage, we can make sure we don't need to take power at that time, and that decoupling has further benefits. So what are we achieving here? Um, the, each of these bars on the graph is one of our houses. The grey line is where we modelled um, what their bills would be. That was our model guesstimate of where they are. And the red line is the average of where they actually are. So what we have delivered, because these homes have now been done for about, uh, about a year, is £500 as the energy bill for all their energy. That's a warm home, enough heating, enough hot water, um, the electricity they use, all for just £500. And within that £500, 300 of that, they actually pay to Nottingham City Homes as part of the financing for all the work we did in the first place. So their actual energy bill here is 200 because they're using very little, but 300 is the charge that comes back to us. And then I guess the, the final thing to say here is that that's what we've achieved already. Now, £628 in bills at the courts, 500 in bills at the 2050s, but we are just about to engage with our energy supplier and our local network operator, the people who run the grid, um, probably within the next month. And we anticipate that we will be able to reduce our costs even further as we actually find ways to take advantage of those uh, grid connections. Um, it has been rumoured, uh, we, we believe we will, we will be able to slash both our standing charge and our unit rates, and that will give us an even bigger impact. And that's me. I'll hand you back to Matthew. Thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Arnaud. Um, so our three speakers have presented their part. Thanks to them for these exciting explanations, showing us the, the issue of fuel poverty, the opportunities rep represented by innovation and a solution implemented in Nottingham with the support of the project Remorban. So now it seems that there is no questions from the participant, but I do have uh, already a question myself. So we discussed a little bit about innovation, and um, I was wondering what is the scope, because usually it's very difficult to uh, define the scope of innovation. 
And I would ask, uh, I would ask Josh, if possible, uh, what is the the scope of innovation for the for the National Energy Agency, and uh, what is considered as an innovation, and what are the results uh, of this uh, innovative approach at the moment? Yeah, great. So. If I think of it in terms of what NEA did, um, so through the Technical Innovation Fund, this was a fund for large and small measures. So a large measure could be sort of a battery storage system, um, a hybrid heat pump, a communal heating system, uh, whereas a small measure could be something as simple as you know, just a smart thermostat. So the scope for innovation, um, on a sort of, we focused on a household level. Um, I suppose further than that, you could look at a uh, system-wide level, uh, looking at different systems and processes, so uh, uh, pricing, delivering heat as a service rather than the kilowatt hour. Um, but for NEA, um, some of the results that we've seen uh, have been quite impressive. Um, for me personally, probably seeing uh, the level of engagement with these uh, technologies. Uh, innovation and vulnerability um, can be combined and uh, work successfully together. And yeah, so we've seen around 80% of respondents uh, incre experienced an increase in thermal comfort and almost three quarters thought the affordability of the energy had improved. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much, Josh. Thank you very much. Um, now, it seems that uh, some uh, questions uh, have been raised. Um, Anton Yenekev uh, writes, uh, 2050 homes, does it represent not only technical solutions, but also financial model? I think this question is for Arnold. Hi, thank you, Matthew. Um, Yes, and this applies to both projects for Nottingham City Homes. So Energy Sprong is a, intended to be a financial model, not just a technical solution. The idea of Energy Sprong is that it is working towards being self-financed and savings in maintenance and savings in cost should end up paying for the cost of the work in the first place. For the moment, we're at an early stage. so. Um, those two things don't quite add up, so there are various grant streams we're accessing to make that happen. Um, but down the line, the plan is as more energy strong homes get done, the cost comes down and we do arrive at a financial model. Um, it's probably worth adding that for Nottingham City Homes, we're looking at all the elements of both of these projects and looking at where they can be applied in other places. So just the PV battery model, we are looking at for where we have new build flats or care homes um, already, because we think there is potentially something that can be self-financeable or close to it or now. And we're looking at how it may work in future with individual homes. The trick with individual homes is principally around software and internet connections. So there's a platform whereby we can use batteries that are in individual separate locations as a virtual single battery. So there's a kind of internet signal that makes them all behave uh, in one way or another at the same time. So yes, it's a financial model. Um, Energy Sprong in itself is a big financial model. And then within Nottingham, we're looking at sub-elements to see how parts of what we're doing might be relevant to other buildings and projects. Matthew. Thank you very much, Arnaud. I think we have another question related to Energy Sprong. Louise Hyde wrote, do you think Energy Sprong will link up to more building in the future? Uh, the answer is yes on many levels. So if, if we start specifically with our 10 in Nottingham and the direct first link, those 10 are a uh, 10 houses in a single um, terrace, kind of. There are two terraces either side of that and some bungalows in association. 
So our mini grid that currently feeds 10 homes will, in our current phase of work, we're on site now, that will be increased to about 40 homes. In Notting, we've also already got the funding in place to run a sort of second and third phase. Um, so we will have done 165 properties in Nottingham in the next couple of years. Um, they are a combination of small mini grids and individual homes, just depending on where they are and how that works. On top of those things we are doing, there are a bunch of people in the UK who are currently uh, initiating or have started other energy strong pilots. So there's one in um, Essex that I'm involved with. There's one just in procurement in London. There is uh, another one down in the southwest. And there is a collective commitment, which a number of social housing providers have signed, which has got something like 600 to 1,000 homes in, which we've been uh, showing to the government and saying, if we could get some further additional funding, we could take Energy Strong to the next step. So yes, it will link in a very direct local sense for us in Nottingham. And yes, there are other UK-wide projects happening too. Thank you. I keep you on the line. We have another question for you. 2050 homes, is it integrated heating system, wrote Anton Yenikev. Uh, not sure what Anton means by integrated heating system, but the answer must be yes, uh, because everything's kind of integrated with the 2050s. Um, essentially, we have used the existing radiators in each house as the heating source. Um, those radiators are all fed back from the central plant. We are developing and exploring the way the controls work for the houses and for the whole system, because we believe there are massive advantages that we can um, get out of the system by being more and more clever with which energy we use when, where, and how. So at the simplest level, when we've got spare PV being generated in the middle of summer, we can make sure that we heat up all the hot water tanks so that we've used the energy that would be spare. At a complicated level, this could be about responding to the grid on a live basis. So if there's cheap power in the electricity supply market, then we can charge up our batteries and our thermal stores. Uh, if there's expensive power, we could actually export from our battery. But it's a, an ongoing process. It starts with the really simple logic controls, and it works up to a kind of artificial intelligence layer of trying to respond to the grid in a dynamic way. Matthew. Thank you, Arnaud. So another question from Louise Hyde. Um, what about incorporating waste heat opportunities? Uh, yes, I guess again is the answer. The question is about what sort of waste heat we're actually thinking about here. So, um, the fundamental or, or standard issue with waste heat and housing is about whether or not, um, when is that waste heat available and when do you need it in your housing? Most waste heat tends to be something that's there all year round and obviously in, in your housing you have an offset demand for when you when you need heat. Space heating is something you only need through the, through the winter months. So there is always a, a, a balancing question, but I will kind of mention a super exciting new project which Nottingham has just got funding for the next phase of, which is a, a more detailed technical phase. So Nottingham's got an energy from waste plant, so it basically burns rubbish and that's what feeds the district heating system. It has that problem I've just described in that the, wa the, the waste is being burned all year round and to some degree that means there's waste being burnt through the middle of summer when there's very little demand for heat on the network. What Nottingham are looking at doing is using that heat to actually heat up mine water under the city of Nottingham. There are various mine workings, so there's quite a lot of mine water. If we can put that heat that we have to generate in the summer through burning waste into the mine water, we can then extract it with heat pumps in the winter, and therefore we'll have created a kind of massive interseasonal thermal storage battery right under the city. If we do that, it means we'll actually also have a fairly high temperature source. So uh, we think we could be running heat pumps with COPs up at eight or, or even higher because the source tem temperature is so high. So yes, we're, we're looking at various things. Some of them are simple, some of them are complicated, some of them we'll be doing immediately and some of them might be five years down the track. 
Matthew. Thank you, Arnaud. You get the thank you of Louise uh, two times. And uh, uh, there is another question. I think it's more uh, for me and for Veronica. Uh, regarding uh, from uh, Yi Chen Hock, uh, where can I get a PDF copy of your slides? Um, I think that uh, the answer is uh, you can get much better than only the copy of the, or the, the, the PDF of, uh, of the slides. You can get the recording of this, uh, of this uh, webinar. Uh, since this webinar will be uh, set on the um, uh, website of uh, r the project Removen, and it will be also on the YouTube channel of Removen. If uh, Veronica has no other answer to give, then I think that there is no more question. Then. I wish you all a very uh, nice week and uh, just wanted to inform you about the fact that before closing this webinar, let me recommend you to stay tuned since our next webinar regarding the interventions uh, realized in the city of uh, Tebebashi, uh, which is another city uh, of the lighthouse, of the three lighthouses of uh, Remoban, Lighthouse Cities of Remoban, is planned for March and more details uh, will be published soon. So do not hesitate to get connected or to be or to look at the information coming from the, the website. So once more, thank you very much for your participation and have a nice week. Thank you to the speakers and the organizers. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.